The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, last time we've seen the curl of a vector field with components m and n, we defined that to be n sub x minus m sub y. And we said this measures how far that vector field is from being conservative. If the curl is zero and if the field is defined everywhere, then it's going to be conservative. And so when I take a line integral along a closed curve, I don't have to compute it. I know it's going to be zero. But now let's say that I have a general vector field. So the curl will not be zero, and I still want to compute a line integral along a closed curve. Well, I could compute it directly, or there's another way, and that's what we are going to see today. So, you know, say that I have a closed curve C, and I want to find the work. So there's two options. One is direct calculation, and the other one is Green's theorem. So, Green's theorem is another way to avoid calculating line integrals if we don't want to. Okay, so what does it say? It says if, say, if C is a closed curve, and closing a region R in the plane, and I have to insist C should go counterclockwise, and if I have a vector field that's defined and differentiable everywhere, not only on the curve C, which is what I need to define the line integral, but also on the region inside, then the line integral for the work done along C is actually equal to a double integral of the region inside of curl F dA. Okay, so that's the conclusion. And if you want me to write it in coordinates, maybe I should do that. So the line integral in terms of the components that, that's the integral of m dx plus n dy. And the curl is nx minus my dA. Okay, so that's the other way to state it. So, that's a really strange statement, if you think about it, because the left-hand side is a line integral. Okay, so the way we compute it is we take this expression m dx plus n dy, and we parameterize the curve. We express x and y in terms of some variable t, maybe, or whatever you want to call it, and then you will do a one variable integral over t. This right-hand side here, it's a double integral, dA. So we do it the way that we learned how to a couple of weeks ago. You take your region, you slice it in the x direction or in the y direction, and you integrate dx dy after setting up the bounds carefully. Or maybe in polar coordinates, r d r d theta. But see, the way in which you compute these things is completely different. This one on the left-hand side lives only on the curve while the right-hand side lives everywhere in this region, inside. So here, x and y are related, they live on the curve. Here, x and y are independent. There just are some bounds between them. And of course, what you're integrating is different. Here, it's a line integral for work. Here, it's a double integral 
of some function of x and y. So, you know, it's a very perplexing statement at first. But it's a very powerful tool. So we're going to try to see, you know, how it works concretely, what it says, what are the consequences, how we could convince ourselves that, yes, this works, and so on. That's going to be the topic for today. Uh, any questions about the statement first? No? Okay. Oh, yeah, one remark, sorry. So here it says counterclockwise. What if I have a curve that goes clockwise? Well, you could just take the negative and integrate counterclockwise, you know. Um, why do, I mean, somehow, why does the theorem choose counterclockwise over clockwise? You know, how does it know that it's counterclockwise rather than clockwise? Well, the answer is basically in our convention for curl. See, we, we've said curl is nx minus my and not the other way around. And that's a convention as well. So somehow the two conventions match with each other. <coughs> that's the best answer I can give you. So, you know, if you met somebody from a different planet, they might have Green's theorem with the opposite conventions, with curves going clockwise and the curl defined the other way around. <laughs> I mean, probably if you met an alien, then I'm not sure if you would be discussing Green's theorem first, but <laughs> just in case, you know. Okay, uh, so that being said, so there's a warning here, which is that this is only for closed curves. Okay, so if I give you a curve that's not closed and I tell you, well, compute the line integral, then, you know, you have to do it by hand. You have to parameterize the curve. Or, if you really don't like that line integral, you could close the path by adding some other line integral to it and then compute using Green's theorem. But you can't use Green's theorem directly if the curve is not closed. Okay, so let's do a quick example. So let's say that I give you C, the circle of radius one centered at the point two comma zero. So, you know, it's out here. That's, that's my curve C. And let's say that I do it counterclockwise so that it will, you know, it will match with the statement of the theorem. And let's say that I want you to compute the line integral along C of y e to the minus x dx plus one half of x squared minus e to the minus x dy. And, you know, that's a kind of sadistic example, but maybe I will ask you to do that. So how would you do it directly? Well, to do it directly, you would have to parameterize this curve. So that would probably involve, you know, setting x equals 2 plus cosine theta, y equals sine theta. But, you know, I'm using as parameter the angle around the circle. It's like the unit circle, the usual one, but shifted by 2 in the x direction. And then I would set dx equals minus sine theta d theta. I would set dy equals cos theta d theta. And I would substitute and I would integrate from zero to two pi. And I would probably run into a bit of trouble because I would have these e to the minus x, which would give me you know, something that I really don't want to integrate. So instead of doing that, which looks pretty much you know, doomed, um, I'm going to Instead, I'm going to use Green's theorem. So, using Green's theorem, the way I will do it is I will instead compute a double integral. Okay. 
So I will compute the double integral over the region inside of curl f dA. So I should say probably what f was. So let's call this m, let's call this n. And then I will actually just use the form in coordinates nx minus my dA. And what is R here? Well, R is the disk in here. Okay, so of course, it might not be that pleasant because we'll also have to set up this double integral. And for that, you know, we'll have to figure out a way to slice this region nicely. We could do it dx dy, we could do it dy dx, or maybe we will want to actually make a change of variables to first shift this to the origin, you know, change x to x minus two, and then switch to polar coordinates. Well, let's see what happens later. Okay, so what is, so this is R. So what is n sub x? Well, n sub x is x plus e to the minus x minus, what is m sub y? e to the minus x, okay? This is nx, this is my, dA, well, it seems to simplify a bit, right? I will just get the ball integral over R of x dA, which looks suddenly a lot more pleasant. And of course, I made up the example in that way, you know, so that it simplifies when you use Green's theorem. <laughs> um, but you know, that gives you an example where you can turn a really hard line integral into an easier double integral. Now, how do we compute that double integral? Oops. Well, so one way would be to set it up, or let's actually be a bit smarter and observe that this is actually the area of the region R times the x coordinate of its center of mass, right? If I look at the definition of the center of mass, it's the average value of x, so it's one over the area times the double integral of x dA. Well, possibly with the density, but here I'm taking uniform density one. And now I think I know, just by looking at the picture, what the, where the center of mass of this circle will be, right? I mean, it will be right in the middle. So that is two, if you want, by symmetry. And the area of this guy is just pi because it's a disk of radius one. So I will just get two pi. I mean, of course, if you didn't see that, then you could also compute that double integral directly. It's a nice exercise. But see, here using geometry helps you to actually Streamline the calculation. Okay, any questions? Uh, yes. Okay, yes, let me just repeat the last part. So I said we have to compute the double integral of x dA over this region here, which is a disk of radius one centered at, this point is two zero. So instead of setting up the integral, you know, with bounds and integrating dx dy or dy dx or in polar coordinates, I'm just going to say, well, let's remember the definition of a center of mass. It's the average value of a function x in the region. So it's one over the area of the region times the double integral of x dA. Right? If you look again at the definition of x bar, it's one over area double integral of x dA. Well, maybe, you know, if there's a density, then it's one over mass times double integral of x density dA. But if density is one, then it just becomes this. So 
you know, switching the area, moving the area to the other side, I'll get double integral of x dA is the area of a region times the x coordinate of the center of mass. The area of a region is pi because it's a unit disk, and the center of mass is the center of a disk, so its x bar is 2, and I get 2 pi. Okay. Now, I didn't actually have to do this in my example today, but I thought, you know, that would be good review. It would remind you of center of mass and all that. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. Okay, so let's see. You know, now that we've seen how to use it in practice, how to avoid calculating a line integral if we don't want to, let's try to convince ourselves that this theorem makes sense. Okay, so, well, let's start with an easy case where we should be able to know the answer to both sides. So, let's look at a special case Let's look at the case where curl f is zero. Then, well, we'd like to conclude that f is conservative. That's what we've said. Well, let's see what happens. So, Green's theorem says that if I have a closed curve, then the line integral of f is equal to the double integral of curl on the region inside. And if the curl is zero, then I will be integrating zero, I will get zero. Okay, so this is actually how you prove that if your vector field has curl zero, then it's conservative. So in particular, if you have a vector field that's defined everywhere in the plane, then you take any closed curve, well, you will get that the line integral will be zero. Strictly speaking, that will only work here if the curve goes counterclockwise, but otherwise, you know, just look at the various loops that it makes and orient each of them counterclockwise and sum things together. Um, so let me state that again. Okay, so a consequence of Green's theorem is that if f is defined everywhere in the plane, and the curl of f is zero everywhere, then f is conservative. And so this actually is the input we needed to justify our criterion. You know, the test that we saw last time saying, well, to check if something is a gradient field, if it's conservative, we just have to compute the curl and check whether that's zero. Okay, so how do we prove that now carefully? Well, you just take a closed curve in the plane, you switch the orientation if needed so that it becomes counterclockwise, and then you look at the region inside, and then you know that the line integral 
will be equal to the double integral of curl, which is the double integral of zero, therefore that's zero. But see, okay, so now let's say that we try to do that for the vector field that was on your problem set, that was not defined at the origin. You know, so if you've done the problem set and found the same answers that I did, then you will have found that this vector field had curl zero everywhere, but still it wasn't conservative because if you went around the unit circle, then you got a line integral that was two pi. Or if you compared the two halves, you got different answers for two paths that go from the same point to the same point. So, you know, it fails this property, but that's because it's not defined everywhere. So what goes wrong with this argument? Well, if I take the vector field that was on the problem set, and if I do things, you know, say that I look at the unit circle, that's a closed curve, so I would like to use Green's theorem. Green's theorem would tell me the line integral along this loop is equal to the double integral of curl over this region here, the unit disk. And of course the curl is zero. Well, except at the origin. At the origin, the vector field is not defined. You cannot take the derivatives and the curl is not defined. And somehow that messes things up. You cannot apply Green's theorem to the vector field. So we cannot apply Green's theorem to the vector field on problem set eight, problem two, when C encloses the origin. And so that's why this guy, even though it has curl zero, is not conservative. You know, there's no contradiction. And somehow you have to imagine that, well, the curl here is, it's really not defined, but somehow it becomes infinite so that when you do the double integral, you actually get two pi instead of zero. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, of course, but uh, that's one way to think about it. Okay, any questions? Yes? But since we know the, the work that we do, can we find the, the curl of f at that point? Well, so actually it's not defined, see, because the curl, would, the curl is zero everywhere else. So if the curl was well defined at the origin, you know, you would try to then take the double integral. Well, no matter what value you put for a function, you know, if you have a function that's zero everywhere except at the origin and some other value at the origin, the integral is still zero. So it's worse than that. It doesn't have, it's not only that you can't compute it, it's really that it's not defined. Okay. Anyway, that's, you know, like a slightly pathological example. I mean, yes? Well, we wouldn't be able to because the curl is not defined at the origin. So you can't actually integrate it. Okay, so that's, that's the problem. I mean, if you try to integrate, you know, we, we've said everywhere where it's defined, the curl is zero. So what you would be integrating would be zero. But that doesn't work because at the origin, it's not defined. Yes? Ah, so if you take a curl that makes a figure eight, then indeed my proof over there is false. So I kind of tricked you. You know, it's not actually correct. So if the curve does a figure eight, then what you would do is you would actually cut it into its two halves, and for each of them you would apply Green's theorem. And then you would still get that, you know, if the curl is zero, then this line integral is zero, that one is also zero, so the sum is zero. Okay, uh, small details that you don't really need to worry too much about, but Indeed, if you want to be careful with details, then my proof is not quite complete. But the conclusion is still true. Okay. Uh, let's move on. So, I want to tell you how to prove Green's theorem. Because 
because you know it's such a strange formula that you know where can it come from possibly I mean so let me remind you first of all the statement we want to prove is that the line integral along a closed curve of m dx plus n dy is equal to the double integral of our region inside of nx minus my dA. And, you know, let's simplify our lives a bit by proving easier statements. So actually, the first observation will actually prove something easier, namely that the line integral, let's see, of m dx along a closed curve is equal to the double integral of our region inside of minus m sub y dA. Okay, so that's the special case where n is zero, where you have only an x component for your vector field. Now, why is that good enough? Well, the claim is if I can prove this, I claim you will be able to do the same thing to prove the other case where there's only a y component. And then, if you add them together, you'll get the general case. So let me explain. Okay, so a similar argument, which I will not do to save time, will show, so it will be just the same thing, but switching the roles of x and y, that if I integrate along a closed curve and dy, then I'll get the double integral of, sorry, n sub x dA. And so now if I have proved these two formulas separately, then if you sum them together, we'll get the correct statement. Well, let me not write it. Uh, we get Green's theorem. Okay? So we've simplified, si simplified our task a little bit. We'll just be trying to prove the case where there's only an x component. So let's do it. Well, we have another problem, which is the region that we're looking at, the curve that we're looking at, might be very complicated. You know, if I give you, let's say I give you, I don't know, a curve that does something like this, well, you know, it will be kind of tricky to set up a double integral of other region inside. So maybe we first want to look at curves that are simpler, you know, that will actually allow us to set up the double integral easily. So the second observation, so that was the first observation. The second observation is that we can decompose R into simpler regions. So, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that I have, you know, a region, and I'm going to cut it into two. So I will have R1 and R2. And then, of course, I need to have the curves that go around them. So I had my initial curve C was going around everybody. And I have curves C1 that goes around R1 and C2 goes around R2. Okay, so what I would like to say is if we can prove that the statement is true, so let's see, for C1 and also for C2, then 
then I claim we can prove a statement for C. How do we do that? Well, we just add these two equalities together. Okay, why does that work? There's something fishy going on because C1 and C2 have this piece here in the middle that's not, in, that's not there in C. So if you add the line integral along C1 and C2, you get you know, these unwanted pieces. But the good news is actually you go twice through that edge in the middle. See, it appears once in C1 going up and once in C2 going down. So in fact, when you will do the work, you know, when you will sum the work, uh, you will add these two guys together, they will cancel. Okay, so the line integral along C will be then, it will be the sum of the line integrals on C1 and C2, and that will equal, therefore, the double integral over R1 plus the double integral over R2, which is the double integral over R of negative MY. Okay, and the reason for this equality here is because we go twice through the inner part. Well, what do we want to say? For the boundary, well, we go twice sorry, along the boundary between R1 and R2. with opposite orientations. So the extra things cancel out. Okay, so that means I just need to look at, you know, smaller pieces if that makes my life easier. So now what will make my life easy? Well, let's say that I have, you know, a curve like that. Well, I guess I should really draw a pumpkin or something like that because it would be more seasonal, but okay. Well, I don't really know how to draw pumpkins, so. Okay, so I'm going to, you know, what I will do is I will cut this into smaller regions for which I have a well-defined lower and upper boundary so that I will be able to set up a double integral dy dx easily. So a region like this, I will actually cut it here here and here into five smaller pieces so that each small piece will let me set up the double integral dy dx. Okay, so we'll cut R into what I will call vertically simple regions. So what's a vertically simple region? That's a region that's given by looking at x between a and b for some values of a and b. And for each value of x, y is between some function of x and some other function of x. Okay, so for example, this guy is vertically simple. See, x runs from this value of x to that value of x. And for each x, y goes between this value to that value. And same with each of these. <coughs> okay. So, now, we are down to the main step that we have to do, which is to prove this identity. If C is, sorry, if If R is vertically simple,
and C is the boundary of R going counterclockwise. Okay, so let's look at how we would do it. So we said a vertically simple region looks like X goes between A and B and Y goes between two values that are given by functions of X. Okay, so this is Y equals F2 of X. This is Y equals F1 of X. This is A, this is B. Our region is this thing in here. So let's compute both sides. And when I say compute, of course, we will not get numbers because we don't know what M is. We don't know what F1 and F2 are. But I claim we should be able to simplify things a bit. Oops. So let's start with the line integral. How do I compute the line integral along this curve that goes all around here? Well, it looks like there will be four pieces. Okay, so we actually have four things to compute, C1, C2, C3, and C4. Well, let's start with C1. So if we integrate on C1, m dx, how do we do that? Well, we know that on C1, y is given by a function of x. So we can just get rid of y and express everything in terms of, in terms of x, okay? So we know y is f1 of x, and x goes from a to b. So that will be the integral from A to B of, well, I have to take the function M. So, you know, M depends normally on X and Y. Maybe I should put X and Y in here. And then I will plug Y equals F1 of X dx. And then I have a single variable integral, and that's what I have to compute. Of course, I cannot compute it here because I don't know what this is. So has to stay this way. Okay, next one. The integral along C2. Well, let's think for a second. On C2, x equals b, it's constant. So dx is zero, and you know, you would integrate actually over the variable y, but, well, we don't have a y component. See, this is the reason why we made the first observation. We got rid of the other term because it simplifies our life here. So we just get zero. Okay, just looking quickly ahead, there's another one that will be zero as well, right? Which one? Yeah, C4 also gives me zero. What about C3? Well, C3 will look a lot like C1, okay? So we're going to use the same kind of thing that we did with C1. So along C3, well, let's see. So on C3, y is a function of x again. And so we're using as our variable x, but now x goes down from b to a. So it will be the integral from b to a of m of x and f2 of x dx. Or if you prefer, that's negative integral from A to B of M of X and F2 of X dx. Okay, so now if I sum all these pieces together, I get that the line integral along the closed curve is the integral from A to B of M X F1 of X dx 
minus the integral from a to b of m of x f2 of x dx. So that's the left hand side. Next I should try to look at my double integral and see if I can make it equal to that. So let's look at the other guy. Double integral over R of negative my dA. Well, first I'll take the minus sign out. It will make my life a little bit easier. And second, so I said I will try to set this up in the way that's the most efficient. And my choice of this kind of region means that it's easier to set up dy dx. Right? So if I set it up dy dx, then I know for a given value of x, y goes from f1 of x to f2 of x. And x goes from a to b. Right? Is that OK with everyone? Yeah. OK. So now if I compute the inner integral, well, what do I get if I integrate partial m partial y with respect to y. I'll get m back. Okay, so so I will get m at the point x f2 of x minus m at the point x f1 of x. And so this becomes the integral from a to b, I guess that was a minus sign, of m of x f2 of x minus m of x f1 of x dx. And so that's the same as up there. Okay. So that's the end of the proof because we've checked that for this special case when we have only an x component and a vertically simple region, things work. Then we can remove the assumption that things are vertically simple using this second observation. We can just, you know, glue the various pieces together and prove it for any region. Then we do the same thing with the y component, that's the first observation. When we add the things together, we get Green's theorem in its full generality. Okay, so let me finish with a cool example. So, there's one place in real life where Green's theorem used to be extremely useful. I say used to because computers have actually made that obsolete. But So let me show you a picture of this device. This is called a planimeter. And what it does, oh. okay. And what it does is it measures areas. So it used to be that when you, you know, when you were an experimental scientist, you would, you know, run your chemical or biological experiment or whatever and you would have all of these recording devices, and the data would go, well, not onto a floppy disk or a hard disk or whatever, because you didn't have those at the time. You didn't have a computer in your lab. They would go onto a piece of graph paper. You know, so you'd have your graph paper, and you would have you know, some curve on it. And very often, you wanted to know what's the total amount of product that you have synthesized, or whatever the question might be. It might relate with you know, the area under your curve. So you'd say, oh, that's easy. Let's just integrate. Well, except you don't have a function. You can put that into your calculator. The next thing you could do is, well, let's count the little squares. But you know, if you've seen a piece of graph paper, that's kind of time consuming. So people invented these things called planimeters. Where, so it's something where there's a really heavy 
everything based at, at one corner, and there's a lot of dials and gauges and everything, and there's one arm that you move. And so what you do is you take the moving arm and you just slide it all around your curve, and you look at one of the dials, and suddenly what comes, you know, as you go around, it gives you complete garbage. But when you come back here, that dial suddenly gives you the value of the area of this region. So how does it work? You know, this gadget never knows about the region inside because you don't take it all over here. You only take it along the curve. So what it does actually is it computes a line integral. Okay, so, you know, it has this system of wheels and everything that compute for you the line integral along C of, well, depends on the model, but some of them compute the line integral of x dy, some of them compute different line integrals. But they compute some line integral, okay? And now if you apply Green's theorem, you see that when you have a counterclockwise curve, this will be just the area of the region inside. And so that's, you know, that's how it works. I mean, of course, now you use a computer and it does the sums, yes? Uh, that costs several thousand dollars, possibly more. So that's why I didn't bring one. <laughs>